So the purpose of the purpose of today is to give you an overview of the key draft changes for the FMUs and ask for your views on the proposals. So we're also keen for you to share your feedback on these and um, this particular phase of the project. So I'd like to not acknowledge that we're not the only ones working on freshwater. Tamaru or Kaituna is actually in a meeting right now. They're a co-governance entity for the Kaituna River. Also, the Regional Council began an early phase of this process with the Kaituna Makatu Freshwater Futures Group six years ago. So it's been going for a while. This session is about the changes in freshwater management and um, will result in rules. So we'd like to thank you for sharing some of your questions and comments when you registered. And we'd like to acknowledge that there's a range of interest here today. Some of you are here for just a general overview of the draft changes, while others are wanting some more technical detail. So there's a lot of questions um, that were raised that will be answered throughout the session. Um, however, if there are questions or comments that are a little bit out of scope or we can't answer today, we'll definitely come back to you um, at a later stage. So since late April, we've been holding drop-in sessions around the region so that community can talk to staff about the draft changes to water management. And we've been gathering this feedback and pulling it all together. And people have provided it online, through email and in writing. This is our second online session only. So um, we're getting the wheels rolling on this and it's another way for us to reach you in the community. Um, the first online session was on Wednesday and that was focused on the Waihi FMU. This session is being recorded, as you know, um, so that we can make it available for others online afterwards. The session today is planning to be finished by 1.30, but at that point you'll be able to have some um, offline chats if, if you'd like. And while we not, might not be able to have hearty conversations in person, um, this is certainly a space we'd like to hear from you today. So feel free to participate um, and put your hand up or uh, make some comments in the chat as well. Nat's keeping a close eye on those. So, the plan here for, to, for today is that we're going to provide a brief overview of essential freshwater. Then our staff will share what the key issue is in the catchment, what the draft policy options are, and we'll also ask for your feedback during the process. We won't be able to dive into the details, like I said, but we will do our best to cover the biggest changes for water quality, surface water quantity, and groundwater quality. And as I said, that's not your only chance to provide feedback. We'll share some other options at the end of this presentation and um, have some more in-depth chat if you want offline. Once again, raise your hand if you're keen to have a chat and speak with the group or pop your questions in the chat. And today we're looking specifically at the Kaituna Freshwater Management Unit. And we acknowledge that the impact this impacts the estuary and we'll cover some of that, but the focus is on managing the issues impacting on our freshwater. So let's make a start and have a brief overview of essential freshwater. In 2020, the government released the NPS FM outlining the direction that all councils must take on the management of freshwater. As a result, Bay Plenty Regional Council needs to change both its regional policy statement and regional, regional national resources plan. And importantly, the rules and policies in these plans to manage how freshwater and land is used. Right now, we're in a community engagement phase, sharing draft policies with community and seeking their feedback. And this feedback is considered by elected regional councillors before a formal plan change process is notified next year. Uh, the region is being looked at in freshwater management units or groups of catchments for management, monitoring and reporting purposes. The Kaituna estuary is one of 13 freshwater management units each will have its own chapter in the plan, and so the rules can be different in different freshwater management units. And for the National Policy Statement Freshwater Management, we're required to involve Tangata Whenua, work with Tangata Whenua and community to set long-term visions for freshwater, prioritise the health and well-being of water bodies, then the essential needs of people, followed by other uses. Improve or maintain water quality to meet national set bottom lines, and avoid any loss 
or degradation of wetlands and streams. Ultimately, it's about looking after our waterways. And Natalie is going to share a link in the chat around the NPS if you wanted to look into that a little bit further. So um, today, as I said, we're looking at, particularly at the Kaituna Freshwater Management Unit. And hopefully you've all received the booklet online that we sent when you registered. I'll see if it looks a little bit like this. Um, and you can also access that in the chat. Nat is going to pop that up. So if you, if you have got two screens and you wanted to look at the booklet, we will refer to the booklet throughout this presentation. Um, so this particular map that we're looking at right now is on page six of your booklet. And I'm now going to hand over to Gemma, who will take you through the Kaituna FMU boundary. Gemma. Uh, kia ora everyone. Um, so the, uh, the FMU boundary here is the surface water catchment boundary that feeds the Makatu estuary and discharges at Tatumu, but it excludes the upper half of the catchment where Lake Rotorua and Lake Rotuiti um, are. So they are included in the Rotorua Te Arawa Lakes um, freshwater management unit. And it also follows the Timaro or Kaituna co-governance boundary. Um, there has been quite a lot of work done in this catchment recently with the um, Kaituna Rediversion Project, which rediverted, uh, redirected 20% of the river flow into the estuary to improve its ecological and cultural health. Um, in the booklet, there's also some discussion on visions and outcomes on pages 11 and 12 you might want to have a look at and provide some feedback on. Um, the outcomes are guided by significant work already undertaken in this catchment with the Kaituna River document and through the Freshwater Futures Community Group. Uh, fishing and white water sports are significant recreational values present in this um, management unit. There's significant use values for municipal supply, stock drinking water, water culture, commercial use, um, and improvements are sought to the Modi ecosystem health and natural character values, particularly in the lower catchment. Um, the pie graph here shows uh, land use with um, just under 50% in forestry, 20% um, in dairying, 17% in dry stock, and over 9% or 5,500 hectares in kiwi fruit. Urban areas make up 3% of the catchment although substantial expansion is planned around Papamao East and potentially Paiangaroa. Um, we're open to your feedback on whether you think that we've got this boundary right. Um, if you want to discuss that now or in feedback. Can, I, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, it's Craig here. Um, the decision to... The Okiri Falls is a cutoff there up the top of the river. So clearly there's a massive influence of what comes out of Lake Rotuiti in terms of quantity and quality. So there must be some integration between the FMU for the other lakes unit in this. Yes. Yep. Um, so yes, um, the fact that Rotuiti and Rotorua contribute to uh, the water or to the Kaituna River, that is acknowledged. Um, it, the, from a water quality perspective, um, they, it's about half of the volume of, of the water, but it's 18% of the total nitrogen load and um, phosphorus load, and then 12% of the total suspended sediment. So the water that's coming out of the lakes is generally better quality than as it progresses down the catchment. And, and on the volume side of things, obviously the control gates, significant in terms of managing flooding downstream, lake levels upstream. Is, 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 water, is quantity part of this issue? Then? Is it just quality? Quantity, Glennis will be talking about later. Um, but my understanding is the Orchid gates are flowing at full capacity at the moment. Mm, yeah, totally. And have been for some time. Just a question on, on that map you got there. And it says kiwi fruit blue, but I'm not seeing blue on the map. Or is that just the, how it translates on 
Zoom maybe. Or am I colorblind today? I'm you not might sure. be. There's two different shades of blue on that um, pie chart. Yes. So next to the yellow, you've got um, the light blue, which is dairy. And then... I'm just not. I'm not seeing any blue at all. Oh, I think you might be colorblind. <laughs> it's quite. It's possible. Oh, you mean on the um, on the map on the right, um, Craig? Yeah. Oh. Hmm. No, so that one is not the same as the pie chart's colour. So the pie chart has the blue in it. Um, the other one is a land use map, which is oh, okay. a right. lot of detail in that bottom right-hand corner that I'm you may there. or may not be able to see. Okay, I got you. Now I'm on it there. Yeah. Sorry there we that. go. when you're done. Okay, thanks. Okay, Jackie, next one. Cool. Thanks, Gemma, and thanks, Craig, for those questions. Excellent. And um, now we're going to hand over to you, Stephen. Yeah, kia ora, good afternoon everyone. Yeah, I'm an environmental scientist here at Toi Moana, so I'm going to cover the water quality. So in general, being a largely rural um, FMU with, with very little industrial and urban development, the water quality issues you know, tend to associate with that, with that type of um, environment. So the key ones for the for the freshwater streams for the receiving body, which is the Makatu estuary downstream, yeah, those those tend to be centered around the amount of nutrients and around the amount of sediment, particularly during storm events, and around fecal bacterial contamination, which is surface runoff from mainly mainly agricultural activities. So in terms of the yeah the, the map you see there, all those all those key you know indicators under the the national policy statement we have um, a framework. So for the first map, it's got over on the right hand side monitored site state. So that framework provides grading for each of the key indicators. So you have A through to the D bands. And the A band is means that you've got a condition which there's very little influence of that or of a good quality for that particular indicator through to you know band D. And in band D, it means that there's quite a high level of stress you've got associated with that, a high level of um, ecological degradation and quite poor quality. Now the national policy statement also has for some of those key indicators on water quality, they provides a requirement for a bottom line above which in the future, you know, you must not be below that bottom line. So I'll just run through these, these maps and some of those, just to show some of the key ones and have a discussion around them. Now on the map, there's four monitoring sites shown. I'll just point out that those are our routine, regular monitoring sites and that we do have a lot of water quality data for the other tri tributary streams and uh, you know, lowland even drainage sites on, on farms. So that's not the only information we've got. So for the first map, it's the nitrate toxicity, which has been banded and evaluated. So we can see that in terms of nitrate toxicity that the Kaituna River and the other streams most of them sit within that A, A band or B band, but I'd point out that nitrate is not only a, a toxicity issue, it gets to a high level, but it's also, um, you know, causes yeah, plankton growth, plant growth. So for the Kaituna River and a lot of the streams, it's not a huge issue in terms of plant growth or plankton growth. That's because of the mobile nature, the pumice beds of those streams. But for the Makatu estuary, it is an issue. And so I'll talk about that a little bit later on in my discussion. Um, yeah, so I'll go to the next slide, Jackie. So the same thing, it's, it's having, you know, looked at suspended fine sediment and and just put that through that grading system so we can see that there's two sites in the La Kaituna which it's saying that suspended sediment is in the D band 
and two which sit in the C band. Now, under the National Policy Statement, they've got methodology for some of these um, indicators, and for this one, it's measured as clarity. So the reality is that the, the river and many of the other ones are not actually in, in a really poor state at all, and we will, you know, like, produce more data later to evaluate it. But like you'll see that up there at a Kerry Falls, it's saying that it's in a C band. There's virtually no fine suspended sediment there. And it's actually related, the drop in clarity is related to you know, the presence of phytoplankton. And in the national policy statement, it even mentions that you know, there can be natural factors involved, which actually mean that you know, the, the scoring's not as relevant. So it's this in this case it's it's so here next slide you should we oh, can we can you flick back because you've actually missed one Jackie I thought you might have so before that one yeah so once again this is another example we're looking at dissolved reactive phosphorus so in this in this case you can see that at a Kerry Falls in the upper Kaituna that we're, that we're grading there at the, in the A band, which means that there's very low levels of dissolved reactive phosphorus and it's very good quality. And as you go down, obviously the levels have increased. Now, once again, you can have natural factors at play. So although land use and activities have contributed to that scoring of those sites in the lower river, being in the D band, there's also high natural phosphorus inputs to those systems, to those freshwater streams. So that accounts for a large part of it. So in other words, even if we improve the, the anthropogenic, you know, the farm activities, et cetera, then we're potentially not gonna get back to that A band because of the natural amounts of nitro, I mean, phosphorus coming in. Okay, so back down to the, now to the estuary. I also mentioned before we start talking about the estuary that some of the other issues around water quality, like this, uh, we monitor for the invertebrates and they reflect water quality. So in the upper catchment, in the, they tend to be score quite well. Whereas in the lowland, particularly farm drains and that, then yeah, the, the values are, and the scoring is quite low. Okay, now, the, for the estuary, for Makatu estuary, as was mentioned, there's recently been an increase in the diversion through to the estuary. That was undertaken to help improve overall the water quality and the environmental state in terms of its ecology for the estuary. So in, in the interim though, it does mean that with the increase in flow, that there will be slightly more nitrogen coming into the estuary. There will be slightly more bacteria, bacterial contamination coming in with that river flow. But then that is countered to a degree by the fact that like for nitrogen, that we increase the dilution within the estuary, we increase the flushing potential of the estuary, which means that, you know, if there's um, macroalgal, for instance, sea lettuce, then if it grows within the estuary, then more of that will be flushed out the estuary. And so overall, we expect that it will have an improvement. And it's other works that have been taken place to look at improvements has been the restoration of some of the farm areas, areas that were farmed in the upper estuary. So in total, those have increased the intertidal area of the estuary by 20%. So not only so with that came, you know, like increases in tidal flows. So we have seen overall with those, with the diversion and with those restoration works in a marked improvement in the upper and mid estuary area in terms of the ecology. So when we look at scoring Makatu estuary, it has a banding system under the um, New Zealand Estuarine Trophic Index framework that's very, very similar and uses the same grading bands as the National Policy Statement. So overall, Makatu Estuary scores as C, so it's only 
you know, it's only moderate to fair state. And the if you look at the subcategories, because we have we same with the um, with the freshwater, we look at a whole range of potential indicators or tohu. So they include things like the heavy metals, the amount of nutrient in the sediments, the organic concentration in the sediments. We look at at the extent of macroalgae and look at the extent of seagrass as an indicator of environmental state. So some of those, like the metals and other organic contaminants, score in the A band and they're actually very low, so there's not a lot of influence from those. Then for nutrients in the, in the um, sediments themselves, then like for nitrogen, it's scoring in the B band. Whereas like if you look at phosphorus, it's starting to score a little more poorly and shifts into the C band. For macroalgae and for seagrass, both of them have scored in the D band and contribute you know, a large part of the overall score, score of being just in the C band. So just to run through you know, what's happened with those with one or two of the indicators, one macroalgae, we've got the current the slide there currently showing how it's changed from the early 40s. It's over time, particularly after 1960, it started to increase. So historically, like there's always been some river flow coming through and then and then there's also the yeah, the catchment which feeds directly into Makatu Estuary itself. So over time within the Kaituna River and around those smaller inflows into Makatu Estuary, the nitrogen levels have increased. And with that, we can, we've seen this you know, reaction of macroalgal cover and Makatu entry and estuary, which has increased over time. Now this, the, on this slide, I've got the data right up to date, and you can see that that around the mid you know, 2015 point that we had a dip and from there it's declined. Now when, when history starts going eutrophic, you don't always have just a steady incline. You, quite often you get very, very high fluctuations in cover of algae because like the macroalgae can grow to such an extent with a nutrient that then it deoxygenates the environment, you get a whole set of processes that take place that can actually kill off the algae itself for a while, so hence it fluctuates. Now, from around the, two, yeah, the last few years, we've had an increase in, in the diversion flow from the previously what was just the 120 cumex per tidal cycle up to the full flow of 600,000 know, cubic metres per tidal cycle. So that's now starting to, you know, like flush some of those areas and change the environment. So what we, so it's still early days, but it's showing that that may have already started helping, you know, like reduce the amount of macroalgal blooms we get, although we'll need to follow that through time to see if that is sustained and to see how what, how the, how the estuary now reaches a new equilibrium with the nutrient inflows and with the, yeah, the water flowing through and flushing the estuary. Uh, next slide, please, Jackie. Okay, so this is one of the other indicators which I mentioned, which is seagrass abundance in Makatu estuary. Seagrass and its growth is a little more complex, but it's, but it is one of those important sort of um, species and it's a keystone species and it can actually modify and increase biodiversity overall stability in your estuary etc. So where the growth starts at around 1940 at that point in time the river had naturally cut through it to Tumu out to the open ocean so there was less fresh water coming in and because of that change and because seagrass does actually thrive in lower salinities it was actually lower lower amounts of it then in the estuary than what you see at the next point, you know, around the mid 40s when the, when the river was flying back through. So that's a nat almost natural type fluctuation. Then when the next point, 1960, some of that reduction there in seagrass will be because of the 
change in the loss of the river flow because at that stage it was put out out through Tatumu. And then as you carry on through time, once again, the seagrass has been affected not just by those river flow changes, but also over time the increasing amount of nutrients that's been coming into the estuary. And yeah, there's, there's a little bit of good news that seagrass had almost gone extinct in the estuary, but there is a small area that's trying to recover, and that's around the township itself, and that may be due to some of the improvements in water quality associated even with sewage reticulation. But there's a lot more work to be done. Okay, so it pretty well covers my part part of it for the, for the presentation. Jackie, I'll hand over to Gemma. Thanks, Stephen. Right, next slide, Jackie. Okay, um, so the key issues that have been identified so far for the Kaituna Freshwater Management Unit, um, the Makatu estuary has significant ecosystem, cultural and recreational values, which are degraded by sediment, nutrient and fecal contaminants. Uh, lowland freshwater bodies have degraded water quality, ecosystem health, cultural values and natural character. Water quality is often not safe for shellfish gathering in the Makatu estuary, and water quality is not always safe for swimming at monitored freshwater sites. Um, also, we have a challenge um, that we haven't, uh, we're looking at how we can incorporate cultural indicators into the plan, um, but we haven't got any in there just yet. Okay. Uh, a high level of change is required um, for the Kaituna FMU and some of the options on how we might achieve that will be considered in the following slides. Um, it's looking like a up to 70% reduction for uh, nitrogen load, 30 to 40% reduction for phosphorus load, up to 40% reduction for suspended sediment load and 40 to 60% for the coli load. Okay, water quality options. So this is pages 21 and 22 of the um, booklet. Um, so some of the water quality management options um, are already in place from central government. Uh, so the government has just released their freshwater farm plan regulations, um, which requires all pastoral farmers over 20 hectares and all horticultural blocks over five hectares uh, to identify and reduce risks on their property. Um, that is already in place, or is, is starting to roll out in the Waikato and Southland, um, and it's likely to be in place uh, in the Bay of Plenty around 2025. Um, we're also considering controlling or minimum standards for activities with, with um, high risk of contaminant loss particularly in lower catchments, irrigation, nutrient application, grazing that removes vegetation, grazing of steep land, active management of critical source areas, raised pads for stock wintering, and raised or enclosed effluent storage on low lands. Uh, for new land use practices, um, requiring that there's no net increase in E. coli, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, or sediment, this may require offsetting. Um, some other options, uh, consents and best practicable option for reducing effects of pumped drainage discharges, retirement of land affected by salinity on estuary margins now and in the future, additional stock exclusion requirements, controlling nutrient inputs across whole catchment, uh, cap on high level of nutrient inputs and potentially sinking lid approach stepped over time. Um, forest management plans at the type of a, at the time of afforestation to address sediment loss. So I'll just go into detail in a few of these. Um, this is one of the options for stock exclusion and riparian setbacks, um, which is being assessed. And key points are that there's a potential to capture streams less than one meter that aren't captured by the central government regulations. 
um, capturing drains um, with smaller setbacks, uh, potentially increasing setbacks with slopes, uh, different setbacks depending on the freshwater management unit that you're in. Um, and what else was I going to add there? That might be all for now. Um, this is another option, which is uh, retirement or restricted grazing of steep pasture. Um, it's, there's a multitude of variations to this option, such as what slope to be used, um, incorporation of other erosion risk factors like soil, stocking rate, weight, duration of time, timing or climate, and lead in time if retirement of land was required. Um, this could be managed through the consent process or through the farm plan process. Um, one of the main reasons for this is that modelling suggests that shallow landslide erosion is the dominant source of sediment um, for all our catchment clusters that um, our science panel worked through. Um, and in those FMUs with high reductions, high load reductions required, it's estimated that shallow landslide erosion is a source of um, around 55% of sediment in the Kaituna FMU. Um, and the reports that we've had um, suggest that landslide occurrence is highly correlated with slope angle, um, with most failures occurring on slopes steeper than 26 degrees. Uh, at the moment, existing regional plan doesn't restrict livestock based on slope, um, but it does control earthworks, cultivation and vegetation clearance based on slope. This will also be covered um, in freshwater farm plans. Um, you're required to map um, slope and soils and manage the risk of soil erosion. Um, next slide, Jackie. Thanks, Gemma. Um, that's great. And thanks, Stephen and Gemma, for sharing um, information on water quality and there's a lot of information there for everybody to take on. Um, here's an opportunity to um, share some of the questions that we're asking the community for feedback on and that includes here online. Um, it's not the only opportunity for you to provide feedback and you can, we'll open, um, open the chat up for questions on what we've just been discussing and also you can um, put your hand up and, and have a chat as well. So we've put um, a few minutes aside for this and um, you can also chat to us when we stop recording at the end of the session if you've got something you'd like to talk about on offline. So um, the questions are what is a reasonable time frame to achieve these water quality targets and we've got 2040 and 2060 there. So if you did want to put um, your preference in the chat that will definitely be taken on board and we'll, we'll take that away with the team. Um, then do you support the suite of draft water quality management options being considered? These are in the booklet as well if you wanted to go away and have a bit, bit of a deeper think about it. What minimum good land management practice requirements do you think we should consider in this FMU? So three uh, big questions there. You're welcome to put it in the chat. Um, and Brett, I think you've got your hand up there, so go for it. Yes, readers. Hey, I just want to probably more towards uh, Stephen's uh, comments about the water quality in the estuary there. Can you hear me at all? Oh, sweet as. Sure hey, um, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, obviously, the more rainfall we have, the more runoff we have from the low-lying grounds, um, your groundwater or whatever you want to call it, um, and the river rises in level, that's the stage when the most nutrient sediment, et cetera, would be flowing down the Kaituna River into the estuary. Um, what stage of the river height does it become, what's the word, double what it usually is with no rainfall, and what stage does it become, holy moly, that's borderline sulfuric acid? Do you guys have a gauge on the quality of the height of the river? Volume or yeah. something? Just a question. Sorry. Yeah, in a, in a general sense, we do. And, and one of the options for this FMU, which is quite unique because of the the control gates, you know, like diverting the river through to the estuary, 
yeah, that we're going to have a look at the modeling at the relationship between particularly suspended sediment, which also correlates to some of the other contaminants that you mentioned, which is you know, the bacteria and the nutrients. But we're going to be looking to see if that can be used for, you know, to optimize for a small amount of time of closure to try and stop some of those contaminants going through to the estuary. So that exercise is currently being looked at to be undertaken. Oh, no, cool. He's no cheese for that. Now, like I say, it's more the fact that when it does rain, obviously, you know, the the river clarity just distinguishes very quickly. And um, obviously, that would be the most contaminant time of the river. Um, yeah, I just wondered if you knew what the flood quality in the river is. You do, obviously. Yes, yes, we do. So we say there's a relationship, and that's the background of the whole modeling to work out the annual loads and and you know determine how much we have to you know like reduce that load to, to meet the targets for the planning but like I say with the yeah with the exercise you're going to do looking specifically at you know what can we achieve by because if in a moderate rain event the amount of of sediment generator is still relatively low so like like you're aware it's those really big rain events and those bigger floods that generate you know like 90 percent of the annual load so yeah so we're going to look closely at that to try and maximize you know some options for you know reducing that and potentially you know closing those gates and stopping that load going through the estuary Oh, no, cool as yeah, I just like I say, just pointing out the visual things I see. Um, obviously, the incoming water in the estuary being clear and blue and the water coming down from the river getting held up in the upper end of the estuary um, is, is what I would think would be a bit of a issue in a way. But um, not sweet as you guys seem to be um, all over it. Beauty. Cheers, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Brett. Um... Cool, and we and we'll be taking um, notes as well. Um, and if we if we've got anything further to add, we will follow up later. Are there any other questions anybody has on water quality before we move on? Hi, um, Jackie Braden's just popped a question there in the chat. Will there be any restrictions on water use or land use requirement changes for the residential areas, or is it all changes expected to be borne by rural areas? I might be the best one to answer that. Um, so for urban areas where they're part of a reticulated system, uh, the discharge consent would be the source, or the municipal discharge consents would be the source of um, their improvements. Um, and then in terms of uh, this, there's potentially um, on-site effluent treatment systems as well. Um, I can't tell you right now what the rules are for that, but they are looking at changing um, the, the rules around um, upgrading on-site effluent systems. So those will probably be two of the main ones. Thanks, Gemma. Um, and thanks, Braden, for the question. Is um, Have you got anything further you'd like to ask? Keep an eye on the chat too. Has anybody else got anything to say or ask at this point? And if anything comes to mind, um, we can definitely talk about it later or you can touch base with us um, as well on email. Okay, so moving right along now to water quantity and Glenis, um, I'd like to pass over to you. I'll just move the slide through. Uh, kia ora everyone, um, I'm Glenis and I'm a um, planner also working on um, water quantity and, and mostly on surface water quantity actually but covering both ground and surface today. Um, so the water quantity issues in this FMU, we've got um, a map here with a colour coding system of from over allocated to, um, to uh, plentiful water supply I guess. Um, and I guess the things of this FMU, 
the water quantity is highly heavily used. There's key industries, there's municipal water supplies, and there's um, quite a number of, especially horticultural irrigation. So it's a really heavily used catchment from surface water and groundwater um, point of view. Um, it's a um, an area that quite fortunately, I guess, has quite a plentiful water supply. These um, streams are what we'd call spring-fed streams, so they, they flow really quite stable flows all year round, um, and, um, and they're quite resilient, ecologically resilient streams with those um, stable flows. Um, and the allocation issues, I would have to say, are relatively minor, despite this, um, this little um, red area here, I think actually the allocation level there is like 101%. So it's only just um, ticked into, um, into the red. Um, yeah, and groundwater, which we're not showing on this map because we've just been sort of working through to finalise those groundwater limits. Um, we've been pretty restrictive about them, but there's some good news on the horizon regarding groundwater availability. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just looking at, um, we got next slide, Jackie. Sorry. Um, what we're doing in terms of managing surface water quantity, um, consistent with Tamanaro to why the health of the stream is our first priority, and we've looked at an approach that that manages that through um, through um, habitat required for fish that live in that stream. At the moment, our, as we're managing streams at the moment, we've got a one size fits all rule. So we allocate the same percentage of water um, or we have a limit for allocation, I should say, of the same percentage of water for every stream um, in our region. Um, but streams are all quite different. Some are big, some are small, some are spring fed like these ones, um, and some are, are, are uh, have gravel bed bottoms and others have um, pumice bottoms. So that same percentage of water has a different effect um, on the ecology of, of um, different streams, um, despite it being the same. So in our new approach, we're looking at, at we've got, and I think it's on, um, on page 25 of your book, there's a, a table that shows you a, um, what we call our target fish, and we're looking to give a consistent level of protection to the habitat of those target fish in every stream in the region. So for some streams, there'll be a little bit less water available, but, but for a lot of streams, that makes more water available because generally our current approach has been pretty conservative. Um, when we set out, we looked at um, uh, uh, setting minimum flows um, based on protecting 95% of trout habitat. Um, from our conversations and from looking at what other councils have been um, are doing in terms of trout habitat, we've, we've now evaluated the 85% and that's perhaps somewhat become our more favoured um, um, uh, level of habitat retention for um, trout. Um, another change that we're looking at is that um, while we've somewhat managed the amount of water we've allocated by that one size fits all limit, we haven't really stopped people taking water when flow is low. Um, the MPSFM is clear, we need to manage both the allocation and the minimum flow. And that means that in future, um, when, when the river flow is getting lower and towards that minimum flow or at the minimum flow, we will need to stop or reduce um, the amount of water that um, people are taking from streams. Um, so uh, that I think will be quite a significant change, but we don't have to, uh, just like the water quality, where we don't need to achieve um, the, the target water quality the year after we notify the plan, um, we can also phase that in.
uh, Scott, uh, regarding stock quarter takes. Yes, that's something we've been giving quite a lot of thought to because obviously we're not going to be in a situation of, um, of um, uh, you know, stock, there's animal welfare issues involved there. Um, and we've been giving quite a lot of thought to that. Um, and I think, um, a, it's it's kind of looking at that phase in, um, but B, the, the, the quantity of water is, is so small that does it really, in most cases, does it really impact? Um, and, and, you know, in, in cases where it does impact, maybe people have to look at more reliable sources such as groundwater. Okay, so looking at the, the options that we have, the table I was referring to before is on the right of the slide. And so our, our first sort of option or decision making point is, have we got the right levels of habitat retention for the target fish species that, have, that are identified there? And you'll see that the, the booklet has what we set out with on trout on 85%, although now we're showing um, an alternative limit of 85% for trout. So that's kind of quite a core um, decision. What level of habitat retention are we working to? Um, and the second decision is, what is the allocation limit or the primary allocation limit? So primary allocation is that reliable allocation that you would expect to take nearly all of the time directly from the stream um, to use. And um, we've, um, for the purpose of the limits that we've shown here, we've made the allocation limit, the, the, the summer low flow minus um, what the minimum flow is. So if we said the minimum flow was 90% uh, of the summer low, of the average summer low flow then 100% minus 90 is 10% of of water would be available as the primary allocation limit um, after that there's also a decision um, should we allocate more water um, but it would be unreliable water what we call secondary allocation you'd generally need to pump it out of the stream and into a storage pond or um, in particular in our region, we've got quite a lot of frost, um, of water allocated to frost protection. Um, during that time, um, often other water is, is not being used and um, more so in streams that are not spring fed, um, flow is much higher in the winter and so potentially there's additional water available. But effectively that's saying when the flow is higher, should people should there be an additional block of water that you can take out of the stream um, to use later? Um, so that is really low reliability water. Next slide. Um, so we've slightly tuned up the, um, the uh, um, graphs from the ones that were in the slide, just looking at mainly at that trout um, habitat retention level. But what this slide is showing, and there's an, a, a few more in, in the same sort of category, the green bar is showing you how much water we've allocated from the Kaituna River, the main stem at present. Um, the yellow bar is showing on our, on our current rules in the plan, which is 10% of the of a low flow in a very dry summer. Um, this is how much water would be available. So that's showing you even against current limits, we are, we've got a lot of capacity um, to take more water from the Kaituna River. When we looked at what we've called here the draft ecologic limit, that's based on that, that chart of the fish habitat retention levels, the 95% for trout and all of those native fish. The blue bar is showing you how much water would be available for allocation in that. And the pinky red bar is, um, is maintaining all of those native fish habitat retention levels, but reducing the, the um, habitat um, protection for trout from 95 to 85%. So it's just showing you the, where we're at now and where we could be for the Kaituna River. Next slide. 
The Rapahoe is somewhat more interesting. Um, you can see from that green bar that it's highly allocated at present um, above the limit, um, above our current limit and above a level estimated to give us that 95% trout habitat retention because trout are present in all of these streams. Um, but pretty much similar to if we gave it 85% habitat retention level. But one of the interesting things I guess about the Rapa Rapahoe is that a good part of that water allocation relates to um, a, a resource consent held by um, Western Bay District Council for a, um, a take. Um, and they haven't used it for a very good number of years now. Um, so while it is allocated, it is um, it is currently unused. Um, so, um, and whether or not they are going to reconsent it in the future, I'm not sure. Um, but it's also coming out of a dam and that adds another complication that's probably not well represented in this chart. But um, yeah, so a few issues with the Rapa Rapa Hoi. Waiari Stream, people will be pretty familiar with the municipal water um, allocation there for Tauranga City Council. Um, so it is um, quite highly um, allocated at present in comparison to our current limits, but really I guess that's because when when that municipal water take was, um, uh, uh, when, when that take was granted, there was a pretty detailed study of the environment um, and it resulted in a decision that the default limit that's in our plan um, was overly conservative. Um, the blue bar um, represents the outcome of that TCC study that that the stream is quite resilient. I think there may be a few differences between that study and the ones that we've done, but still it shows that the stream is quite resilient and native fish are um, given high levels of habitat retention and that trout um, may be somewhat less. And if we looked at 85% of trout habitat retention, would probably be more similar to that pink line there. Okay, next slide. Thanks, Glenis. That's great. That's um, that's a great overview on surface water quantity. And um, we're now at the question stage. Jim is actually just answering a question within the chat. Or are you going to do it online here, Gemma? Might be easier to just do it online. Yep. Um, in terms of, I'll answer it in two bits. Um, in terms of um, restoring wetlands, at the moment on page 12 of the booklet, um, that is part of our environmental outcomes, is about creating and increasing and enhancing the extent and quality of wetlands in the lower Kaituna catchment. Uh, and I think going forward, that will be heavily encouraged. Um, in terms of managing the extra demand on freshwater, hopefully Glenis's discussion just now has covered off whether the water is available, uh, but that would also have to go through the consent process. Yeah, I could just, um, I think going back to that previous question that you were touching on about, um, I guess, urban water demand, municipal water supplies. Um, in our plan, and, and I guess not discussed in detail in the booklet, um, we've, um, we're, we're looking to have a, a much more robust assessment of what is efficient allocation um, for, um, for water, and that applies to municipals as well as to um, all other users. Um, and when we um, some time ago now notified Plan Change 9, which we um, subsequently withdrew about water quantity. We had a, um, a quite a detailed um, water management plan that municipals would need to go through in order to prove that they were being efficient with water and that um, they needed what they were allocated. Thanks, Glenis. 
and there's a few more questions. I'm sorry, I'm I'm not sure who um who's come in through because it's the it's a phone number. But thanks for bringing those questions through, and um, the team can um, come back to you either online or we can also touch base with you afterwards with those if everybody's comfortable with that. Cool. And and this is um, an opportunity to look at the questions that we're asking the community around this particular um, topic. And um, these can be found on page 17 and 18, oh, questions 17 and 18 on page 27 of your booklet. So if if you wanted to feedback, um, there's some more information in, in there around the questions. Um, is Does anybody have any questions they'd like to bring up on the forum right now? Okay, that's cool. Thank you. And um, we'll move through to um, the last couple of slides before we um, before we summarize the session. So moving through, Glenis, um, ground draft groundwater quantity. Thank you. Oh, you're on mute, Glenis. There. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, we've been doing quite a lot of work on groundwater um, quantity, groundwater availability, um, some of which came through after we um, published these booklets. So, um, uh, and, and so that makes the information there quite high level in the booklets, but the, the principles um, do apply. Um, we set limits to groundwater so that we um, basically are looking after um, stream flows because the reasons why the streams in the uh, Kaituna FMU flow um, uh, at a really stable rate like they do um, with quite high flows is that um, they're heavily fed both from the lakes and from um, springs that are feeding into them all year round. Um, and we also are looking to keep um, ensure that we're keeping salt water out of our aquifers. Um, there's Taking groundwater is often a more efficient use of the total water because um, its impact on surface water is spread over time. So um, I guess there's these thoughts of encouraging groundwater use because it is it does make a total of more water available in an area um, and 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 potentially reduces environmental effects. Um, it's also more reliable. So if people are, as, as we um, in future are giving effect to minimum flows, people with a really high need for reliable water may choose um, if, if um, streams had high minimum flows or highly allocated to consider whether groundwater provided the reliability that they need. Um, we're also um, in touching on that that municipal water, both for municipal water and for all other uses. We're looking to be more efficient so that the water we allocate is water that's reasonably needed by the um, user, rather than sort of banking water and setting it aside um, where it's sort of not taken but not really available to anyone else. Um, we're developing, um, we've, or we have now looked at new management zones in the Kaituna. We still have that shallow and deep aquifer, um, but with the bigger zones, and we believe that much more water can be sustainably allocated. So the work we've done um, has really shown us that um, when we apply, applied a a, a consistent approach across the region that perhaps historically we'd been underestimating um, the amount of groundwater that was available for allocation um, in this area. And um, uh, quite soon we'll be able to um, produce some more detailed information on that. Thanks, Glenis. And um, we 
have highlighted here three questions around groundwater quantity and open the floor up if you'd like to ask any questions online or um, you can pop something in the chat and we'll endeavour to reply there or we can have a chat after the end. Um, so yeah, that does the summary. If any of you um, want to give any feedback now that we can we can put to the policy, then um, put your hand up and or um, yeah, have a chat because this is our last slide and um, we'll move through, not seeing anyone um, with any questions. So we'll move through to how you can give more feedback. The next event for Kaituna is on Friday the 15th of September and that's between 2 and 6 p.m. It's a drop-in session so you can come anytime between then and we'll be there to ask any questions you might have and also um, it's a good chance to provide feedback if you have got any. And um, We don't know where that will be yet but um, keep an eye on our website and the venue will be updated there. You can go online to um, Look at, for more information and we've got hard copy booklets for feeding back on this FMU at all of our offices and the events that we're at. So the feedback booklet um, looks a little bit like this and um, it's, it's hard to see on my screen but um, we'll also include a link um, to that. So um, yes, all views to be shared by 30th of September, that's our deadline and um, we hope that you've enjoyed this session today and it's answered a few of your questions. Shortly, we're going to um, finish up and um, do a closing karakia, at which point we'll stop the recording and you're more than welcome to stay on for an offline chat. Um, Nat, I'm not sure. And thank you, um, Gemma, Glennis and Stephen um, for your time. And thank you everybody for coming along today. Thanks, Jackie. Um, yeah, feel free to continue to pop your comments or feedback in the chat um, there. Otherwise, the links that I've shared um, will take you to the uh, page that will have updated venue information and times um, for all the future um, events that we have on this. And also the link to the page is I've popped that up as well. Yes, the videos for these sessions, um, we're just finding the best place to put them. I think they have to be sort of um, transferred into like a YouTube clip so that they can be shared a bit more efficiently, but that they, the recordings will become available hopefully by next week. We're just trying to sort that out sort of today where we're going to put them. Um, and yeah, I will I will close this part off with a karakia and then um, I will just stay on the line for about half an hour if anyone wanted to have a chat offline. All right, so um, ka whakairia te tapu, kia wātia ai te ara, kia tūru ki whakataha ai, kia tūru ki whakataha ai, haumie, huie, taikie. And I will just stop the recording now. <laughs>